And my role here is Senior Usability Analyst and also Practice Leader in terms of usability. I'm uh, really excited to be here. Um, and basically, I think there's a lot of, I get a lot of thought in terms of how to best start off this practice and start talking about issues around usability. There's a number of different ways into this discipline. One way would be sort of explore uh, the nuts and bolts of it, explore um, sort of the pieces. And in some way, really, usability analyst or information architect putting together uh, pieces and providing experience for users. Uh, pieces like buttons, <clears throat> you know, radio buttons, uh, widgets, drop-down menus, and overall sort of composing the constellation of all these different elements into uh, screens, provide some sort of architecture design. And so, well, that's one way into, uh, and, and then ultimately, looking at a bunch of these designs, usability uh, engineers or architects, basically come up with um, heuristics or sort of uh, rules of thumb, guidelines in terms of what should go where, what color should they be, how should they interact. And so that's one way into this discipline, sort of heuristic evaluation, sort of one thing that a usability analyst will do, call in, hey, how does this look, how are these elements working? Uh, and that's determined a number of uh, heuristic evaluation would be one sort of tool that folks are, uh, that usability analysts would use. Um, others would include things like card sorting or uh, paper prototyping, interactive prototyping. Um, overall, one of my goals in terms of uh, this practice is getting anyone who's interested and certainly as many people as possible, sort of familiar with that practice of getting uh, prototypes and tools in front of users before we actually pull them out. I think it's, and for me, as somebody that's designed a bunch of software and worked on different levels of software design, uh, uh, it's an extremely exciting you know, process to actually watch the end users um, in front of your application to learn from that and turn that. So I, I, I consider my role to some extent somebody that will facilitate that process, not necessarily the person that's going to do all the usability, but somebody that will sort of facilitate working with you to uh, build those prototypes and work with the users for us all to learn from that experience. But, so rather than really focusing on sort of the widget part or the, mm, the different procedures like the uh, heuristic evaluation and paper-based prototypes, I really want to focus on today sort of more the end goal. I think that if you started off by sort of talking about like the flying buttress with the little button and button design, widget design, you know, lose sort of the overall idea of architecture or, or even by looking at the blueprints or the, the process by which an uh, information architect would do their job, I think you'll lose the, the idea of, yeah, what do you really want to achieve? What do you want the person that's going through this cathedral, going through this environment to sort of experience and think about and sort of relate to their environment? So that's basically what I'm hoping to achieve today, is sort of talk about the larger goals of usability engineering. My argument is going to be that the goal of engineering uh, in terms of usability is really flow. When I talk about flow, I'm going to refer to something specific. So in terms of flow, uh, I think we all have some notions about what we mean by flow. Things like workflow might come to mind, or uh, flow diagrams. By flow here, I mean something fairly specific. Um, Specifically, this book, which I brought a copy of. Is anyone here familiar with uh, this book, Flow? Um, by, it is, it is, let's see if there's any ringers in the audience. Does anyone actually know how to pronounce his last name? He said, Me hi. There we go. There's a ringer. That was cheap. Crazy. And just reading a little bit from the intro to his book basically says, uh, and should say, sometimes I think I, I don't want folks to leave here thinking I'm sort of like New Age or something like that. Some of this stuff, <laughs> stuff reads a little bit like that, like a little bit self helpy, and it's it, uh, it, it's a little bit dangerous and sometimes to like to walk on that line. But he's an established University of Chicago psychologist. It's a huge best-selling author, and it's really super interesting stuff. And so yeah, basically I've learned a lot from interacting this book and some of his work. And so yeah, I'm gonna sort of. Explore the boundary between his work and his practice of usability. So he starts off saying, This book summarizes for a general audience decades of research, 
on the positive aspects of human experience. Joy, creativity, the process of total involvement with life I call flow. This book tries to present general principles along with concrete examples of how some people have used these principles to transform boring and meaningless lives to ones full of enjoyment. There's no promise uh, of easy shortcuts in these pages, but for readers who care about such things, there should be enough information to make things to make possible the transition from theory to practice. All right, so you see it's a little bit um, soft, but at the same time, books filled with stories um, of uh, let's see. What um, basically, my premise is yeah, rather than focusing on the widgets. Rather than focusing even on necessarily the blueprints or information architecture diagrams, what we really have to focus on in terms of usability is people. Just getting sort of a general sense, almost like a uh, an empathy for. Uh, and I, I I don't know if people have seen this. This is like an Edward Tufte line, but people Tufte loves to say, "Yeah, there's only two industries that refer to um, their clients as users." drug industry and the computer industry. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's always, you always kind of bite your tongue a little bit when you're referring to like, like our clients as users. But um, sort of getting an empathy for the people who are actually using our products um, and understanding, trying to give them the sort of experience that Shitsume Hayi describes in here as being flow, an optimal experience, living life. So, um, the book basically describes folks doing things like uh, fly fishing, playing saxophone, um, you know, playing contact bridge, all these things that basically bring about optimal experiences. You know, so I'll describe a little bit. You know, it's a it's a fairly good book. I, I feel free to borrow it from me, or um, I think it's like fifteen bucks or eleven bucks from Amazon. But um, I'll try next five minutes or so just to sort of talk about what he means by flow. So flow is a state in which people are involved, so involved in activity, nothing else seems to matter. Experience is so enjoyable that people will do it even at a great cost or for the sheer sake of doing it. Um, I was actually, I remember, uh, I don't have too much time for asides, but I remember going around the room once and giving a talk about flow, and there was an older professor in the room who said, you know, we're talking about like, where in your life do you sort of maybe achieve this? And somebody said, yeah, fly and the older professor said, sex. And I, it was a really odd thing to say. I sort of tried to make an argument, or I tried to, like, and it turned out to say, sex, not sex. <laughs> <laughs> that sort of experience, uh, playing a musical instrument. <laughs> and really, uh, um, I really think that pretty much the book be understood through one chart that's in the book. And basically, he sees, you know, he's a psychologist. He looks at all these different states, interactions with life, working um, uh, through all sorts of different activities that people are engaged in. And he sees sort of a two-dimensional diagram. One is the skills that you bring to uh, something that you're working on, and one is the challenge it presents. Something that's really low, and low, he would say, is something like television. It occupies time, not necessarily a reward. Something with a uh, really high challenge, low skills, it would be something like e uh, education, perhaps, maybe over here. Reduces some degree of anxiety, uh, but you know, ultimately challenging, hopefully rewarding. Something we've got really high skills, but low challenge. Um, I don't know, actually, one sort of community of scholars these days that have sort of picked up this a lot is uh, folks that do stuff around video games, video games that are really hot. Uh, Academic discipline these days, um, and this and I'll talk about that in a little bit if I get time to. Uh, but I think it maps onto here really well. Video games are, as opposed to maybe a fourth grade classroom where you're sitting there, a video game is something that's going to continually challenge you. It's going to get harder and harder. So as a result, as you build up the skills, the challenge gets harder. And so that's perhaps why you see you know, more fourth graders maybe engage for hours at the end at, the end, uh, at an Xbox. Not necessarily bring that same sort of commitment or time to the uh, classroom. To the classroom. Um, so overall, this again, I think you could almost forego reading the book if you sort of get this diagram. Flow is where skills, your own skills, and challenge intersect. 
Um, and just to talk a little bit using his language, uh, you would say flow derives from activities that meet one or more of these components. So that your attention would be completely absorbed in the activity. Activity has clear goals. Uh, activity provides clear and consistent feedback as to whether you've achieved those goals or not. Activity is so absorbing that it frees the individual, at least temporarily, from uh, other worries or frustrations. It just occupies you. Individual feels completely in control of the activity. And all feelings of sort of self-consciousness disappear. Last one. Time is transformed during the activity. And his methodology is mostly through interviewing some like, ethnographic field work, but you'll often hear about these accounts where, yeah, that fourth grader that just played um, whatever Xbox game for the last 10 hours, didn't realize that this was 10 hours in the past. It was, time was just lost on that time. I'm sure that going around, actually, it was kind of interesting in voting up for this. I read a little study that said, um, just maybe a quick show of hands. Who here like, has never, never really achieved? Experience that. Who, who has experienced something like this in any discipline? Yeah, it's wild. In um, the, I read a little research paper and said only 15% of people have really self described that they had experienced this, which is just astounding to me. Um, but regardless, that's um, basically just sort of a thumbnail sketch of what he means by flow. Okay, so overall, I think my take home point this message is really want to try to provide, there's not really any stories in here about, this is, I think, copyright of 1990 or so. Um, it's not any story, again, there's stories about fly fishing, bridge and stuff. It's not really any stories about sitting on the computer so much. Um, but still, I think there's some real uh, applications to be made uh, in terms of wireless generation or products and just thinking in general about this um, field of usability. I think overall, Goals could be to build environments, applications that facilitate this sort of flow, or at the least, build environments that don't intrude on the existing flow that our customers, our users may be achieving in the classroom. Maybe that's where um, you know, that, that community of practice, the folks that are actually teaching, that's where they achieve flow in their life. So let's not build tools that interrupt that flow. So let me give a few examples. All right. Oh, and actually, here's my sort of take home point. Uh, so, by sort of focusing at least on flow, it could almost be, it doesn't necessarily have to be flow. In this case, though, by at least focusing on uh, people, focusing on how they're thinking about skills, how they're thinking about challenges, uh, how they're interacting with the world, that's a very different way to come at this material than starting off with buttons, and starting off even with methodologies. Right? So I intentionally didn't the title of this talk, the goal of user usability engineering is aligning interface widgets according to established heuristics. <laughs> that's a part of what usability does. It's really, that's focused on the technology. Usability is focused on the person. Instead, goal of usability engineering is building environments that provide optimal experiences. <clears throat> So, um, I, I mean, that was really impressive, or interesting at least, the fact that I could say that everybody sort of gets it, what I mean by flow. You can even say, um, I've experienced that. So here, uh, again, because the book, or maybe we're not, maybe we're thinking about experiences like dance, or hobbies that we have, or things that we do, that aren't necessarily computer related. I'm gonna bring up a couple of examples of interfaces or systems. Um, that are sort of computer-based, or at least related to computers, and or at least information flow. And then I'm going to close with a couple of examples of some work that I've been working on just in the uh, month or so that I've been working with The three things I'm going to talk about are um, bookmarking a web page, remembering an idea, writing a report. And here, even, I just want to make the distinction. We were talking about a process. It's a great book in this discipline, maybe even the best book, uh, by Don Norman, The Design of Everyday Things. Um, it's definitely seminal in terms of usability. And 
But here, you know, you can see on the cover, he's got this ill-conceived, ill-designed teapot. This is a terrible teapot design. And that's <laughs> Here, I don't, want to, I, I don't want to talk about nouns, like this teapot so much. I'm going to talk about procedures or processes. Because essentially, that's what we're building for our customers. Um, our experiences, not just the widgets, but the interaction between uh, the things that we're building and their own experiences. So we're really going to talk about the nouns. I'm going to talk about three different sort of verbs, three different processes, and talk about different ways that technology could be adopted or built sort of facilitates flow with each of them. Technology might also interrupt or uh, intrude on the flow. So the first one is bookmark and web page. Right. With all this, uh, I don't know how much time, 327, uh, I'll commit to at least finalizing something at 345, maybe going another 15 minutes for people who can spare the time. But all of this, if we have time for give and take, just come up to me, you know, have lunch or something, if you have any ideas, if you don't have time for a lot of Q&A today, I'm interested in expanding these ideas uh, and getting feedback on them. So the first one, um, first off, how many folks use uh, sort of social bookmarking tag system like Delicious or something? So maybe about a quarter of that. Um, uh, I've been using one for maybe a year and a half, or two years now, and it's astounding. Uh, it's an astounding, astounding tool, delicious specifically. And I'll demo it. And it's astounding in a number of different ways, but um, one specific way I think is related to this idea of flow. So let's say I'm uh, surfing the web, I'm getting information. I, you know, traditionally might be like reading one of the blogs. I see, okay. Interesting. Well, here's this band I like, and they've got a new album out. And uh, what do I do with that information? Or uh, let's say I find, yeah, here's an example of this artist that I like, and I want to sort of store that away. I might want to refer to that later. Traditionally, like the bookmark systems that are built into Netscape and Mozilla and the early browsers, um, very categorical, yeah? And they still sort of exist. First step is sort of to say, okay, I decided I want to hold on to this information. And um, I don't know, I've, I've lost my bookmarks over the years so many times, just for the years and such, I'm sure everybody else in the room has too. I'm sure at this point there'd be you know, thousands and thousands of bookmarks. But the point I want to make here is the first step is sort of a categorical activation. I've got to decide where I'm going to stick this thing. Is it art, artists? I've got to decide, um, you know, maybe there's a subcategory of artists that are just painters where I'm going to uh, throw this in place. And then even if I throw it there, there's no guarantee that I'll find it or I'll act on it in some way. One of the things that these social bookmarking tools, delicious, and again I'll put resource, these resources, I'll link to them on the side, do <clears throat> is, okay, let's say I found that same uh, resource, Album I'm interested in, I'll rather than saying bookmark, you know, add this bookmark to this folder, I'm just going to say boom, I'm going to tag this. I'm going to apply a tag to it. And I've already done this so much, I'll say maybe music. Uh, I know I have an added tag uh, called desire, things that I might want. <laughs> and I'll say And then later I could go back and see uh, all the different things I've tagged. Uh, what, but this is an aside, but one of the things that's amazing about these social bookmarking tools is that they are social. Anybody here can look at all my bookmarks and see what I desire. Uh, and so it's a great way to share information uh, between people. But really the point I want to make is that what I did by just clicking tag and deciding on the category, deciding on the tag for that information, I didn't really have to activate sort of uh, categorical thinking. I was just really applying what came to mind for me, but the, those words. Here, um, there's a researcher at UC um, Cal University of California, Berkeley, Rajmi Singh. She does some really interesting stuff around this area. And she'll say, like, yeah, the process around categorization, the first process around actually bookmarking, is okay. I mean, that, 
I found this thing, this uh, Roots Have a New Album, I, this is worth remembering. The next step is multiple concepts are activated. Okay, Roots, Philadelphia Band, Rap Band, Music, uh, all these different concepts. And then the next stage is to choose one of those concepts. And this is so like, relevant to flow, I think that often what happens is you get sort of paralyzed by that categorical thinking. It interrupts your flow, your actual thinking, working process. Whereas tagging, that offers, there's really no stage one. And I'm sorry, there's no stage two. You remember, you, you interact with the information that's worth remembering, you activate all these concepts, roots, uh, music, Philadelphia, and I can just type in all of those different tags. I tag those information multiple ways. It's not fixed to one sort of category. It's a very flexible way of tagging or identifying that information. And I think it fits into an overall sense of flow much better than uh, overall book marketing. So I'd say that's my first sort of example of um, designing a technology with sort of flow in mind on the user's mind. Second one would be very related, um, and that's remembering uh, an idea. Overall, I was a very early adopter of the Palm Pilot, but then I haven't used one in a long time. Um, and what actually actually got me frustrated with it was almost that same process that I just described. If I was having a conversation, somebody mentioned you know a great movie to me, um, and so I'm sort of in flow. I think conversations are good models of flow or debates. You're both being challenged, um, and uh, what's the other axis? Skill. And your skill uh, is being tapped. You're trying to you know kind of sort of one up. It's sort of it's sort of. Um, uh, interact with somebody on a you know sensible, intelligent, skillful level. So I think a conversation could be an example that could bring about sort of this flow state. All right. So in that conversation comes up a movie. Who's seen a good movie recently? Science of Sleep. Science of Sleep. Okay. All right. I, I forget your name. Paul. Paul. So uh, Paul says to me, uh, Science of Sleep, and I say, Okay. I'm a film pilot. And my first step is to activate the software. Then I go through my to-do list, and uh, then I think, oh, actually, there's a category called movies to watch. <laughs> and I take movies to watch, and I type in um, science of sleep. And that sort of categorical thinking, that sort of those intrusive steps, are basically what drove me away from being a pond pilot user. By the way, I find it really interesting working here for a little bit. How many, how few people seem to really use the pond pilot? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's why. But um, an alternative technology that sort of gained favor in some circles is this something called the Hipster PDA, which is basically uh, designed you know, not only to be low tech, but to be responsive to that exact flaw in the sort of Palm Pilot categorical way of working. Paul mentions to me science of sleep. Oh, science of sleep, that sounds good. We're having a conversation. I can like remove continue a conversation or at least flow right back into it and I put science of sleep back on the end. There's no categorization, there's no like uh, activating that into my mind. I've just got this trusted system that I can now later go back to. And this is also dependent on sort of later processing all that information. And so if you break down that part of the system it's not that good. But in terms of the actual <laughs> uh, uh, in terms of the actual inputting into the system it's outstanding. It's awesome. It's low tech. It's very easy. And most of all, I think it keeps you within that flow. I think it's a, a very low overhead sort of technology. It keeps you doing the same thing that you're doing. Again, that's what my argument here is that we want to build tools that not only um, bring people up into that state, that's sort of a lofty goal of flow, but also at least try not to intrude on their flow and what they're doing uh, in other aspects of their life. Um, by the way, I think this is the last book I was going to reference. Are people familiar with this book? Yeah. It's a great book, sort of like, uh, at least for me, it's been an awesome book in terms of just um, somebody that's, you know, been somewhat challenged in terms of organizing all my stuff my whole life. This is like a great um, system, really, for uh, teaching you how to organize, organize your stuff. And that's sort of the premise behind it all is doing just like that. Not for me to have to spend time remembering later. What was that movie that Paul suggested to me? But to have this tr trusted system where I don't have to walk around with all these things in my mind. Just, everybody's suffering from information overload. It's basically just a system that um, allows you to not have that sort of cloud of ideas around your head. 
and it's called getting things to people. All right. Um, okay. So actually, I've got one more. This one I'm maybe less confident in, but I sort of want to explore. And that is sort of writing a report. So again, the thing of writing as a report, as I think also a decent example of something that optimizes both sort of skill, <coughs> your ability to put all these ideas together, research, and also uh, challenge. Hopefully, challenges can get greater and greater, even write more complicated reports and more discriminating audiences over the course of the year. Um, and actually, yeah, I had a couple of um, sort of scenarios to go through first before we can talk about writing a report. The first one would be, again, going back to video games. Imagine that kid playing video games hours on the end, achieving the state of flow. Scenario two would be the same kid playing video games, his mom coming in asking for dinner. Would that interrupt flow as I should have described it? I think probably, yeah. Or if all of a sudden, you know, uh, a question were to come up on the screen asking him, you know, a history question, it would probably <laughs> interrupt flow dramatically. So similarly with writing a report, adults writing a report. Um, we get uh, pinged on IM, we get um, uh, email that we've got to check, basically constant uh, interruptions. Writing reports, I mean, occasionally I'm sure, just as a work process, we all sort of cage off and find time, unplug, work on something for a few hours when we need to, and there's business reasons for staying plugged in. I'm not a radical, I'm not, present, I'm not uh, <laughs> proposing that we all plug our IM accounts. But, um, I am saying that that sort of um, attention is sort of counter to what I would say is that sort of flow, interacting, that interaction between a challenging task and a skillful way of going about it. And so there's a couple of ways to um, go about this. I mean, you could just totally, again, deny that. The email, the thoughts, the thought, I pick up the laundry, or those remembrances that go on. Or we can build environments and systems that allow users to easily move between those tasks, incorporate them into the larger goals of their flow activities, in this case, writing a report. And I don't know, I was, I was sort of, um, uh, so basically building an environment, not just an application, but thinking about our whole operating system as an environment that allows us to move through these tasks sort of seamlessly. Um, when I, uh, I was teaching, the first thing I would teach or make sure that my students were familiar with were key commands. And it was pretty interesting. I only, a few of my students were actually familiar just with you know, copy, paste, undo, uh, uh, cut. Um, just, just by learning those few key commands, really, uh, in my experience, just to save like, years of, of my life, rather than having to go again to this menu system, edit, cut, copy. Um, uh, just in terms of time, but also in terms of flow. Just getting uh, more and more skilled in these environments where we're working. And um, I think rather than exploring too much where I think the hierarchy goes, touch typing into these key commands to maybe app tab or option tab on your applications, moving back and forth to things like, uh, it's not Mac users here, but there's a tool on the Mac called Quicksilver. It's an incredible tool that basically <laughs> really facilitates what I'm talking about. It's the sort of thing that if you're working on a computer, I mean, first off, it's an application switcher, so if all of a sudden I want to write open word, I can do all this stuff without really moving my mouse. I, I just hit option space, and I type in a uh, command, and I can, you know, whatever, run Excel just by typing in a couple of letters. But then it gets really cool because I can start to do things like type in words. Uh, here is Type in, you know, that I want to define in a dictionary in terms of, uh, or if I heard a movie, science, <laughs> I can say I want to append that to my um, text file called movies. I better open up that. I know you all think I'm moving. But then I would have this text file with all the movies I've heard recently are good. And so without having to go into that application and run it, a Quicksilver application allows me to move through those uh, very quickly. 
seem to have opening an application. I'm sort of, again, interrupting the flow of my work. <clears throat> All right, so there's a couple of examples of sort of what I mean where um, uh, thinking about usability, again, not necessarily in terms of the buttons uh, and interface elements, but thinking about it overall user experience as people approach their computers and their work. So I'm going to close with a couple of exa examples from the work that, uh, the little work we've done so far here. Uh, the first one being um, film Grace with Kasloff, and small group advisor. Um, and there, well, I think this would maybe be a good example for the next practice talk where I should talking about um, some techniques for doing usability analysis. In this case, we did a uh, paper prototype. We really just ran you know, two users together through it. But again, sort of even just by doing that, not thinking about it as like you know, a controlled experiment, like a drug company would do, but just you know, as an uh, uh, opportunity to watch people interact with you know, this paper version of our software and being a touch point for conversations and decisions. I think, I think it was successful, although I don't know if it was. <laughs> uh, but here, just a couple of decisions that we're able to make uh, from that work, and not only that work, but also conversations and realistic <coughs> evaluation, or in some cases, just common sense. Here, sort of the uh, original design uh, designer. Uh, you can see it's quite a bit of text over there on the right. What we saw almost immediately the users, you know, there's quite a bit of scrolling, the next button's below the fold. Here there's quite a bit more text explaining all of this. And maybe it's a little stretch, but I think you could say that yeah, this is not the sort of in, in environment that facilitates that sort of flow of experience that we're looking for. You could also approach it from the other way, say there's a heuristic or design guideline that says just that much text is bad, you know, more from the um, top up and bottom down. But regardless, I mean, I think through that, uh, we're able to come to uh, a different um, interface that was uh, much less text heavy. Basically, you can see none of that text is basically there. Here, it's focusing more uh, on areas of the interface. Different, uh, very specific feedback about those areas, such that the user with a sentence or two at a time, as opposed to, some, these aren't the final screenshots, but they're just not too far from the final. Uh, something that I think, when you're thinking about sort of the seamless interactions, uh, flow, you know, I don't know, maybe it's a little bit of a stretch, but at least I sort of wanted to show some of the work that, uh, that we've been doing with usability, and I think it sort of fits into this argument of flow. This next thing I want to show you, though, real quick, is um, I think fits better. And that is uh, the work Chris Rush is doing. I just started working with him, but no real meaningful way yet, on Direct 1.2. Right here, we've got this assemblage of great looking reports, very powerful data. Um, uh, and one of the problems with them, though, is that they're uh, created fairly independently to create this great uh, report. Uh, this great report through an interface that looks somewhat like this. And to create those two reports, it's basically a matter of drilling down, doing it all, starting from scratch for your second report with an interface that looks like this. And so one of the big things about the newer version of Direct uh, is this ability to sort of drill across. You've already got uh, identified as students, as classes or districts that you're interested in. And so why create a new search from scratch? We're not allowed this functionality that allows you to drill across um, to different reports based on the same students or schools or whatever level of granularity you're currently working I think that worked great with Flow. I mean, imagining here we're uh, thinking about our users as very skilled uh, users, people who want uh, to be able to extract and find out patterns in this data, providing them a tool that doesn't, inter doesn't, uh, doesn't mean that they have to go back Requeue all that data all the time. As, instead, they can move <coughs> it seamlessly. They can 
and sort of flow through uh, this information, have an interface that allows them more easily to sort of recognize those patterns. So we're not sort of laying it all out for them, we're just providing a tool that allows, as their skills in evaluating data uh, uh, gets more and more heady and advanced, I think we're providing a tool that allows them to sort of exert those schools, skills in a sort of seamless manner that's not interrupted by, you know, sort of screens up like this. So I think that works pretty well um, with this sort of notion of flow. I think just about on time. Uh, overall, I'd say, I'm going to stick to this premise that the goal of usability engineering is flow. I'm going to say, really, the role of the usability analyst is in part really an experienced designer, focused not uh, necessarily on just widgets, but on people and their experiences and uh, their environments. And yeah, not just a widget. <laughs> Again, resources are up there. And I think we have time for questions. But thanks a lot for coming. Thank you. Um, I have a question about, uh, I'm glad that at the end you got into navigation, because um, you know, if you look at just one screen, you can talk about widgets all day long, but then you miss some of the bigger picture. And, there's, when I see a conflict, and maybe uh, wondering what you think about this, on the one hand, if you have, it's, uh, you can think of it as the opposite problem of jotting information down, how do you get it back? On the one hand, if you have everything, just one way to get to a particular bit of information makes it easy to remember how to get there. So you might say, okay, well that's better for flow. On the other hand, if, if you have to then, to get to another bit of information, have to go through a very involved process to back out or you know get to some common starting point and then drill back down, then you're you're maybe you're impeding flow. Do you have an, uh, an idea of how to resolve that? I think it's an interesting question. Um, and I don't know. I mean, do, you, do you have an idea? Can you answer that? I mean I I don't really accept that the yeah. idea yeah. one I thought sorry yeah. just the idea the idea that, that I, I, I know when I feel like I could get some, I want to get somewhere faster and I can't, and I experience that. I think it's, um, it's something I've grappled to as well, especially, I just mentioned it quickly, but I don't know if you picked up on it, but in terms of tagging and the retrieval, um, actually I think the tagging system and retrieval is actually really flexible, fluid, it's easier for me to search and get back information from these dumb things. That I've looked at last couple of years. But it's also dependent on this whole other process I have to sort of add into my life. And so I think that the usability stuff, I think it's interesting around um, this, this combination of human based activities and what the machine allows you to do. Uh, I think. Uh, I mean, I think it's to say like half of it is, is actually teaching the person how to use the software. That's a very related concept. I don't know. I'm sure. I don't know. I think we can talk about that. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. That's a good starting point. It's very easy to answer. There's, um, I mean, in relation to that, a couple of uh, things that I think about are like um, iTunes or uh, the music store or like various apparel shopping sites have a lot of ways to categorize yeah. the things you're trying to do, but they also keep track of like things you've recently been across. Mm -hmm. So without having to go back up and yeah. navigate back down, you can just jump back. Yeah. Um, so in other words, remembering what, how the user navigates <coughs> and yeah. presenting that as a, Yeah, because a lot of times it's like, oh, what, you know, what's that? And sometimes they'll say, you can go back to that and then That'll be a jumping off the point for other things that people who bought this bought or liked or list like on Amazon or like other lists. But on. So you can sort of shortcut through some of those things by seeing what you've already done. Other teachers like this yeah, right. report? Or <laughs> 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 well, I like Netflix, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we think we have trouble. We get to the categorization problems. We have three students for us, but we have to decide when we click on a student. 
which we seem to think that, that makes sense, right? I want to learn more about the stream clicker, but then we're in this mindset of now I have to pick what report they see, and it's that fixed at that point. Whereas they know where they want to go or what they want to see. I don't know if we've actually figured out how they think about it. Because if you did say click on it, just a simple menu came up there that made the right assumptions, but then gave you three options rather than this kind of like heavy tabs and nabs and like we're guessing what good things. Maybe there's a possibility there. But I mean, I think you're right in that neither one of those answers are the right one, neither one seems convincing to me. Like every time we start over from the report, because there's what I want to see. But then the always guess exactly what we're going to do next just because I click on something. It's something it's you can show on the direct too. It's like uh, coming up with, I mean, I think your point, I mean, a lot of this is um, just out in uh, Chicago or something. You know, I mean, with principles, it's just so interesting to see how they came at the data. So, uh, and also watch people, for me, this dibble for the first time. It's so key to me sort of understanding the software, especially the interactive. And so then after that, trying to get their mindsets as they think about the data, I'm really there yet. But it seems like until you're really there, it's very hard to design. That was the question they're asking when they click on that statement. Exactly. And so that's a challenge here for, I think, the direct now, Chris, I mean, it's really good sense for uh, how the information interacts with them. And I think it's related in our future reports, too, to some extent. That you're drilling down from class to detail rather than from school to student. Right? Um, I guess the, the that's one of my questions because I'm kind of intrigued about the idea of sort of flow in the in the stronger sense, you know, in the sense of the book being applied to some of these questions. It, it, but I guess one of my questions is the um, I guess in a lot of ways, most many classrooms are are anti-flow environments um, in you know, a, a very fundamental sense. And so I guess this question, and, and, so, and just looking at the task of assessment, some people see it as a very anti-flow activity because I'm breaking up the rhythm of my class and you just sit down with this child and do this activity. So, um, so I, guess my, I guess my question is, how do we think about designing for flow in a non-flow conducive context? And do we think about the boundaries of, of what we're trying to do a little bit differently? Oh, that's a really interesting question. Um, and I think, so. I, I, first off, I totally uh, agree with the premise that I think that the way classrooms are typically designed are not technically flow conducive. I think that, uh, you know, just imagining like, some of our students in the room who are listening to somebody is a totally different, totally different sort of experience than learning through flat fishing, the first person uh, interaction with the environment that's continually more challenging. Getting back to that. Um, Video game idea, I think that's one of the reasons that that started to, I mean, it's picked up not only sort of like, um, not really by sort of like a theorists in English departments, but a lot in education departments. So there's video games as examples of meaningful activities for kids. And I think that, um, the thing about a video game too, it also incorporates evaluation in a very meaningful way. You get immediate feedback about whether you're doing something right or wrong. To try it again, see if you've uh, gotten better at that uh, skill. So I think that there's a lot, and um, so I think overall, I think there's a lot uh, of opportunities to push the boundaries of traditional education and evaluation. I don't know, maybe that's a little bit far afield from what's practical and able to be done in schools right now, but overall, I think my thought is that it's, I mean, actually, again, I was researching for this. Um, it's my idea. I guess one of the things he's working on right now is consulting and working in the domain of education. So, I'm sorry, I'll read up and see what's going on most recently. Uh, uh, I'm not going to do that for students, being in a traditional classroom is not a flow experience, but in my experience, teaching. 30 students because it's, you have to be so intently aware of where everybody is, it's a flow experience for a teacher. So maybe a question would be, how can you bring, without the anxiety, <laughs> yeah. that sort of intensity to our applications on a Palm Pilot so that maybe there is less exiting out and re-entering applications or, 
I'm not sure, maybe it pops up your next student and prompts you to keep things flowing. So, I mean, that was occurring to me too, is like watching again just a handful of people dibble, uh, um, and watching, I saw two types of dibblers on this one who mastered it, was done, and sort of looked around the room, like a lot was going on, and the other who uh, mastered it and used the opportunity that she mastered the technology to increase the meaningful interactions she had with the students she was working with, encouragement, and through body language, not just feel it. And so it's something to think about. I don't I didn't come to any conclusions about what to do with that in terms of changing the environment, but uh, I totally agree with your idea that actually teaching is a very sort of flow experience for your reasons of time, your basic group. Yeah. It's a totally different mode than me. So. Things to be had for the six user models, or however many they have, the, from the mom to the whatever else. Um, and have, have we consider? Are you working on kind of developing sort of different teacher user models? I mean, which address kind of gener generational differences between people and sort of uh, kind of the, the kind of experiences they want to have, and, and how to kind of have a product that kind of works across. I'm really intrigued with the idea. I'd be curious about whether there's. I think as I work with more on stuff here, I'll sort of try to figure out if it's useful whether to go down or not. The Lawrence and I were just in the plan last week at a whole thing put on by Phillips Design that was all about personas. It's kind of like a hot topic uh, in this area. It's defining who your users are. More often than not, actually making a cardboard kind of. I was actually at a conference last year, it was, uh, and this guy from Cisco said, yeah, we had extra money in the budget, so we actually made these, you know, 11 inch action figures for our persona, so you guys are a joke teacher, uh, and I can remember what it was. But uh, overall, I mean, my gut is that, overall, I think it's a very useful process for some of I think it's probably useful here. I mean, I think the work that, the lower work I did in Chicago just showed me there's a lot of different types of administrators and principals in terms of how they interact with everything. And so if the process of whether it results in personas or is, is more just about going out there and trying to identify who those folks are. And so um, I think there's a number of really good reasons to do it. The thing I like to land with is one of the things that's most useful about it is it really facilitates communication. I think any time you're making something abstract to seemingly real, talking about a real, real person as opposed to teacher, um, just to back up a little bit, a persona would be like we are designing for Michael Rentloff, who lives on the lower side, he's got a good kid, um, you know, these are the TV shows he watches, so you just really get to know who this person is. And I think, my good is that probably for software development, it's helpful to that when you sit around the table, it's, again, it's closer at thinking about the user than thinking about the widgets. I mean, anything that does that is probably so I think overall, I'm not sure exactly where we'll go with that, but it does seem like one of many interesting tools that we can go with. It seems like user testing tends to point toward, the kind of feedback you get from user testing tends to point toward an iterative kind of design process. I'm just wondering about your thoughts, if any, on kind of big upfront design versus more iterative processes. Yeah, iterative. Um, yeah. So I think overall, yeah, uh, I think, um, I mean, that being said, I think it's, I have a friend of mine who's really big in the um, community. Aaron, I know we'll talk about a little bit, but it's like that buzzword. Uh, the oh, agile, right? agile to the development. So he's sort of sending some resources on being agile in a larger company. I mean, this shop is very small, so I think it's a little easier to be more iterative. But I think, again, really not being that, yet being that big a part of any software development. Speak for what fits in a shop like this. But overall, I think there's just from the literature, I mean, it seems like one of the things that stood out over time is that the area of design is better than the tool. This gets to Greg's point a little bit. Maybe um, 
if we don't think of I mean, the, the process of, the, of doing an assessment disrupts what a lot of teachers do, but maybe it doesn't disrupt some teaching styles, uh, like maybe there are kinesthetic teaching styles that have kids doing more individual things during a particular class session. So maybe maybe what we can do is instead of trying uh, of you know impeding sort of a, a traditional teaching style, um, having recommendations for managing the classroom on assessment day. So like you know trying to sort of move that down to where we don't impede as much, um, and maybe that can be you know sort of approaching from the other. I mean, the thing with kinesthetic stuff, when you, know, you, know, you see these articles, you don't know if it's like the groundswell or if it's an individual case, but there's a lot of attention, some attention being paid to what we call the dance dance revolution sort of technology. Where, you know, it's sort of, kids love doing that. Uh, it's like a good springboard for phys ed because kids will, it's a, an interactive like, game where you're actually dancing. You get feedback immediately, you get feedback, you know, you're hooked up. Uh, to a heart monitor to understand whether you're really exercising or not. It's not that expensive a tool to implement. But um, I think that that's an interesting model that's very different from a traditional classroom. Uh, it just happens to be, in this case, kinesthetic, but maybe we could apply that same model to other things. Um, yeah, I so thanks for coming. And, uh, yeah. I'll see you around.